Hello and welcome to lecture 3 of the principle of relativity in Phys 1104 and it's time to get a little more mathematical. What we're going to do in this lecture is take a bunch of the ideas we've seen in the previous two lectures and derive them with a little more mathematical rigor and in the process we're going to get a whole bunch of other equations that we're going to find useful in problem solving. Let's start by thinking about you and Trogdor, and each of you has a set of axes. I'm going to call your axes A and Trogdor's axes B, or you can think of those as the names of your frames, and so there are origins OA and OB. And Trogdor is moving relative to you with some relative velocity VAB, right? That's the velocity of B relative to A. And initially, you're at the same location, so your origins coincide. And remember that a frame is also a clock along with the axes, and so you each have a clock, and as you pass by each other, you synchronize your clocks. So we're calling the time when you pass by each other t equals zero. And now Trogdor moves off to some other location. And let's say that at some moment, some event E occurs. What is an event? What do I mean? It's just anything which happens which has an identifiable location and time. So I've drawn it as something like a firecracker going off, but it could be anything where we can specify when it happened and where it happened. You and Trogdor can now make measurements of the position and time of that event. And what we're interested in is how Trogdor's measurements relate to yours. The first thing we're going to do is assume that your clocks stay synchronized. That seems reasonable, right? If you have good clocks, that once you've synchronized them, they should stay synchronized. But experiment actually tells us that this is not a good assumption. This doesn't agree with experiment. However, as long as Trogdor isn't moving too fast relative to you, where too fast means close to the speed of light, then this is a good approximation, and so we're going to use it. So that means any time you measure is going to be the same as the time that Trogdor measures, and so we can just drop our A and B subscripts and call it T. So the time of the event is just going to be T sub E. And now to think about how the positions relate, the key thing is to notice this vector RAB, which is just the position of Trogdor's origin relative to your origin. And if you just look at this trio of vectors, you can see that there is a vector addition going on there. And so the three vectors are related like this. The final thing is that we can think of how this RAB relates to Trogdor's velocity and the time. Well, clearly, RAB is just that velocity times TE, since at time zero you were at the same location. And so we can just replace RAB in this equation like so. So we've got these equations now, and I'll just mention that that second equation is often solved for RBE and written this way in a lot of textbooks. That's fine, but I prefer this first version for reasons that I'll tell you in a bit. And, you know, th there doesn't seem to be all that much to these, right? This is just saying that everybody measures the same t, and this really just came from a vector addition. Nevertheless, these have a name. They're called the Galilean transformation equations, named after this guy. And so what we're doing here is what is called Galilean relativity. Although in this guy's pretty responsible for it as well, but he's got so many things named after him. Let's give this one to Galileo. Now, when you saw the title of this unit, you might have hoped, or at least thought, that we would be doing stuff by this guy. And I wish we could, but we just don't have time, and I'll just briefly mention it. So, the big thing about Galilean relativity that turns out not to be consistent with experiment is this clock staying synchronized. And what's replace, what replaces that in Einstein's special relativity is that all observers agree on the speed of light. That ends up leading to a very different set of transformation equations that we call the Lorentz transformation equations, which is more consistent with experiment. But the good news is that for observers at low relative speeds, so in the limit as v goes to zero, these reduce to the Galilean transformation equations. Let's move on from how positions transform to look at how velocities transform, which will allow us to reproduce what we had in the previous lectures. And so we need to track something that's moving. So instead of you and Trogdor observing an event, you're now observing some moving object, and you want to keep track of where that object is. 
So of course you each measure its position and we already know how the position you measure and the position that Trogdor measures at say this initial time are related. And now at some later time relative to you, the object and Trogdor have both moved. We could of course look from Trogdor's point of view too. First thing to notice is that there are a heck of a lot of vectors on this diagram and it's getting a little confusing. So this is actually one of the few cases where just doing the math is a little easier than looking at the picture. So that's what I'm going to do. But before I do, I'm going to show you where, you, where we're going in the diagram. If you look at, in this diagram, how the object's displacement looks to you, the object has gone straight to the right. But if you think about what Trogdor must have seen, then you can see that the object relative to Trogdor has moved a little left and a fair bit down. And so clearly the observers don't agree on the displacement vector, and so what we're going to have to find is what the transformation is between those displacement vectors. So here's the diagram to help you tell what the symbols mean, and let's just do the math. Here is the displacement of the object relative to you, and that's just the usual definition of a displacement, a final position minus an initial position. And what I'm now going to do is I'm just going to use this relation to replace each of these with expressions in terms of positions as measured by Trogdor. So I'm going to have the displacement relative to you, and it's now going to be equal to, and so this part is going to turn into and this is all going to be minus all the same stuff initially. Now look at what we've got. If I just collect the RABs I'm going to have RABF minus RABI. Well that's just delta R A B. And then collecting the BOs, I'm again going to have R B O F minus R B O I, and that is just delta R B O. And so there is our transformation relation for the displacements. The displacement transform that we have will let us get the Galilean transform for velocities and accelerations. And actually we've already seen the transform for velocities in the previous video. If you want to see the full derivation, I've put it into a supplementary video. Or you can try working through it yourself, which would be even better. So here I'll just summarize it quickly. We know the definition of velocity in terms of displacements, and so if we just take the displacement transformation and divide through by delta t and take the limit as delta t goes to zero, we get our velocity transform, which I used repeatedly in the last lecture. This now, just by subtractions, as we saw in the last video, gives the transformation of change of velocity, where you may remember what happens is that because changes always involve a subtraction, the relative velocity of the two frames just cancels out. And so we have this very simple relationship, which leads through the acceleration definition to a very simple transformation of acceleration. It just says that all observers in inertial frames agree when they measure the acceleration. These are the relations we've now got. This first one is one of the Galilean transformation equations, and from that we got these two relations. And in particular this one I used repeatedly all through lecture two of this unit. And if you look back, you'll actually see I rather sneakily used this one in lecture one when I was talking non-inertial frames and what um, uh, Sam would see uh, on an accelerating cart. So now we've actually got justification for them. And I'm just going to finish up by pointing out some nice things about these. So this has a form that makes it easy to remember. Now I'm still not advocating that you memorize it, however, 
I'll point out that there's this nice thing that you can think of it as if these bees that are on the inside here sort of cancel out and this now collapses down, right? These R's somehow combine to give you this R-A-O, right? And so that's why <laughs> you can think of this that way. This one has the same structure, right? And you can think of the bees in here as sort of canceling out to give you that. And the one remaining thing I'll point out is that, let's say this is U, A, and here is someone else, B, so that um, there is a position vector that we would call R, A, B, right? The position of B relative to A. And if you think of what the position of A relative to B is, like so, it's clear that just R A B is negative, is negative R B A. And similarly now, if you just take the derivative of both sides, the time derivative of both sides, then all you end up with is that V A B is negative VBA, which we've actually used a bunch of times right from the first few minutes of this unit. So now we've got all these justified. Let's look at an example. So here are Connie and Stephen on skateboards. They're in a training session with Garnet, who's standing on the ground down here. And according to Garnet, both Stephen and Connie are going 8 meters per second to the right. And at some point, Connie jumps off her board, and after she jumps off, Garnet's measurement of Connie's velocity is that she's moving 6 meters per second to the right. And here are the inertias of Connie and her board, and let's find out how fast Connie's board is going relative to Stephen after she jumps off. The first thing to realize is that we can easily find the board's velocity relative to Garnet using methods we already know from previous units. There's no new physics here, this is just an explosive separation uh, where there's only one unknown velocity and so all we need is conservation of momentum. And so here is conservation of momentum for the system of Connie and her board in Garnet's frame of reference. And that can be solved reasonably easily, and you can work it through and get this answer. Now is the slightly new thing. If we want the velocity of the board relative to Stephen, we just have to do a Galilean transformation of velocities, which I've written here in the way we've seen it, or here it is in terms of components. So we can do that pretty easily. The velocity the x component of the board relative to Stephen, we can get just this way from the velocities we already know, and here we go, it comes out as 16 meters per second. Now let's redo this working in Stephen's frame of reference. So the first thing we need to do is transform all these velocities into Stephen's reference frame. Now you can probably see intuitively that initially the velocity of Connie and her board is zero in Stephen's reference frame, but let's just see how that works out with the equation. So it comes out zero as expected. Similarly, we can see that Connie's velocity after she jumps off comes out as negative 2 meters per second. And so now we have everything translated into Stephen's reference frame, and we can work there. So first, we can write conservation of momentum. Notice that this side of the equation is just zero. The thing I want you to notice is that by transforming into Stephen's frame, it gave us a conservation of momentum equation that was slightly easier to solve. What we're going to see 
in the next video lecture is that sometimes, particularly with difficult problems, it can be much easier to solve the problem if you transform into a well-chosen reference frame.